Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Marcella. I am a Super Silvers member, and today we have a very special nephrology subspecialty VMR. I'm very excited to learn more about this fascinating subspecialty and learn from this case. Um, so let's just start with some introductions. Uh, we have first Dr. Leticia Rollon. Um, she's an associated professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and a board certified nephrologist. Uh, Dr. Rollon earned her medical degree at the David Jeffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. During her undergraduate career at UCLA, she was a Regents Scholar and upon graduation from medical school, she completed both residency training in internal medicine and nephrology fellowship at UCSF. Upon joining the faculty at UCSF, she was selected as a John A. Watson Faculty Scholar. She has a passion for medical education and works on curriculum development and implementation as an assistant director for the Reno Endocrine GI and Nutrition course in the UCSF Bridges curriculum, as well as associate director for the UCSF San Joaquin Valley Prime program. She also oversees the UCSF Department of Medicine Fellowship Diversity Committee and is the faculty advisor for the Latinx Medical Student Association and Medical Spanish Elective. Dr. Roland is also an affiliate faculty member for the UCSF Latinx Center of Excellence. So welcome, Dr. Uh, Roland. And we always uh, want to know more about our guests. So we will have to know why nephrology and also what do you like to do outside of medicine? Thank you so much, first of all, for having me and for inviting me. It's really such a treat to be here. As you said, I really love medical education and I love teaching. Uh, if anything, I, I probably talk too much. So you all definitely have to um, uh, stop me so that to make sure that, that we get through the whole case. But it's a very good question. Why nephrology? I will tell you that when I was a medical student and I finished the nephrology course, I threw away the book. I said, I will never be a nephrologist. This is the hardest thing ever. I am, I will, I'm not going to do this. But what I actually really liked, um, the renal physiology was very difficult for me. But what I really liked was the clinical aspect of nephrology. Uh, once I was in residency and I did a lot of rotations um, in nephrology, I realized just the diversity of patients. We see very young patients with autoimmune disorders to very older patients with a lot of chronic comorbidities. Um, you see patients in uh, different stages of life. So through pregnancy, um, through, um, you know, through temporary issues like kidney stones versus chronic issues like a chronic kidney disease. So it's just what I really liked was in the clinic every single patient was different. I could, it was never like I was going to see the same, uh, the same case, even, uh, even with the same diagnosis. So I liked that it was very interesting, um, very diverse. And I also practiced in a lot of uh, different settings. Um, on outside of work, one of the things that I, I, that I really like to do, I come from a really, really huge family. So um, I have like, almost 70 first cousins. And I just really, really like going back home to my hometown and just hanging out. We say, oh, we're just going to have like a little barbecue. And then like all of a sudden there's 50 people there. Um, so I really like, um, I really like uh, to spend time with family. Oh, thank you so much. That sounds so, so great. Um, and thank you for sharing your love for nephrology. It's inspiration. So we also have uh, Dr. David Lee, um, who will be presenting a case. So Dr. Lee was raised in the Sichuan province, the spice capital of China, prior to growing up in Dublin, Ohio. He spent his undergrad honing his skills in lion dancing and urban exploration at John Hopkins, where he studied neuroscience. During medical school at Vanderbilt, uh, David fell in love with the loops of Henley and has never looked back. He stayed at Vanderbilt for three amazing years in internal medicine residency prior to transplanting to UCSF for nephrology fellowship. Uh, when not learning nephrology from a wonderful group of attendings and fellows, David enjoys reading epic fantasy, playing Dungeons and Dragons, and hiking with his husband, Bryce, in the beautiful outdoors of the San Francisco Bay Area. His clinical interests include case-based learning and palliative nephrology. 
Uh, and also, it's uh, really good to know that you can find both of them on Twitter. So we are going to send our handles on the chat if you want to learn more after the VMR. Um, so welcome, Dr. David Lee. Um, could you please also introduce yourself and tell us more about why nephrology? And you already shared on your bio more about your hobbies, but I think we would love to know uh, what type of epic fantasy do you like to read? What places do you like to hike? Hello, thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to echo Leticia's comments. It's just so wonderful to see uh, people from all over the globe coming together to like uh, learn uh, clinical reasoning and like share fun cases. This is it's just such a cool experience. So I'm very honored to, to be here. Um, I, I, I knew I wanted to go into nephrology um, during the renal physiology block of medical school, actually, like as soon as we started it. Um, I think we were we were doing acid-base problems where you needed to like solve for like the anion gap and then like see if it was primary or secondary metabolic like acidosis or whatever. <laughs> that was just, it really resonated with me because I really like math and numbers. And I mean, not all nephrologists have to like math, but I, I personally do. And um, it just reminded me of doing like math problems growing up where you're like taking out a paper and pencil and you're just like uh, calculating or like figuring things out. Um, and that translates into the clinical practice too of nephrology because we're like, we're looking at numbers, we're looking at lab values, we're looking at pathology. It's all very objective data and you're taking a lot of objective data together to then figure out what's, um, figure out what's going wrong. And then after that, you ha we have a lot of tools to then like help the patient. Like um, we've got a lot of different medications. Um, we can figure out like the hypotonic saline rate for hyponatremia, for instance. Um, we have dialysis. So um, once you've figured out what the problem is, you have a lot of different ways to like actually make, an, make a change, which I really like about nephrology. Um, yeah, so things that my, my favorite books right now, um, I've re, I'm rereading some Brandon Sanderson. He does uh, epic fan. He I think he's gonna he's gonna be bigger like than George R. R. Martin with Game of Thrones or whatever. But once he gets um, once he like he's very particular about having like copyrights and stuff. So I think in the future, in like five, 10, 20 years, he's gonna have like a next big epic fantasy TV TV series. Um, I also, every Tuesday, um, some of my friends from residency, um, Trevor Stevens and Peter Thorne, um, Peter is a nephrologist at University of Minnesota now, and then Trevor's applying it into a nephrology fellowship this year, but he's uh, still a resident at Vanderbilt. Um, we get together on Tuesdays and we play uh, Mario Kart on Switch and kind of chat while we're, while we're racing about like in interesting cases we saw and stuff. But yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, that sounds um, to be so much fun. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Um, so before we start the case, we also have Shema doing the teaching points. Shema, could you please introduce yourself? Um, hello, everyone. I'm Shema. I'm currently a fifth year medical student in uh, Berlin in Germany and preparing for my upcoming exams in April. So otherwise, Outside of medicine, I enjoy um, taking photos. My friends already know that I like to take photos around all Berlin and otherwise um, going to museums and enjoying coffee. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friend. Um, we also have Deborah describing. Hi, everyone. I'm Deborah. I'm a medical student. I'm, I'm now I am in Argentina. And nothing outside of medicine, I like to travel and during my free time, but I like to drink tea as I'm drinking right now, but I have a problem. I can't take one flavor of tea. I have to take two or three. I think, I don't know, it's, you know, some crazy things that we do, I'm doing right now. So <laughs> that's something about me. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing. I'll definitely try that. So I think we're ready to start. Uh, so David, the mic is yours. Um, all right. So we uh, have a clinic patient that's going to be the case for today. Um, and the setting is you are in nephrology clinic 
and someone has been referred to be evaluated for ongoing uh, cola colored urine and recurrent AKI. And the HPI. So he is a 70 year old man. He has a past medical history of type two diabetes, coronary artery disease status post uh, PCI, um, uh, PCI about five years ago, and then a uh, history of melanoma status post excision. And he's presenting to a clinic um, to be evaluated for ongoing cola colored urine. Um, history is mostly obtained by the patient, from the patient, his wife, and then some of the local nephrologist records. Um, and yeah, it's kind of a long history with multiple hospitalizations. So I think we'll get back to his HPI once we've gone over the rest of his medical history, family history, and physical exam and labs. Um, so um, we've already discussed his past medical history, just those three things. Um, the medications that he's taking, he's taking baby aspirin once a day, amlodipine, metoprolol, um, insulin nightly, simvastatin, phenofibrate, omeprazole, and he's taking penicillin 5 tablet daily as well. Okay. Um, surgical history, he's had a cholecystectomy. That's it. And then family history, his um, mother had a heart attack. He doesn't remember the exact age, but around her late 60s. Um, and then her, his father had some kind of kidney disease, but it was, he doesn't know what the diagnosis was. Um, social history, he uh, distantly had a history of smokeless tobacco, but no smoking tobacco. And he drank one glass of wine daily in the past, but he stopped in the last year as after he was getting sicker and he has no illicits, um, no allergies. All right. Um, so uh, Dr. Alone, if, if someone is being seen in your clinic for the first time um, for evaluation of cola colored urine, um, what kind of questions might you be thinking about asking him and what would you be looking for on physical exam? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I think the first thing that you want to see is when you when somebody's coming to the clinic, it's really important to try to get a sense of what is the most important that you need to figure out um, in, you know, in the next 20, 30 minutes that you have with the patient, because you want to make sure that you know, is this something that is chronic? Is this something that is new? Um, is this a problem that's been going on, on and off? So just getting the tempo so you know the urgency of the problem. Certainly, whenever you hear something like cola colored urine, the urgency gradient, the, 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 it goes up uh, quite a bit. Because what cola colored urine is, is signaling to, um, to a nephrologist is that there's blood coming from somewhere. And I'll get to the to that uh, differential shortly, but also this issue of recurrent AKI. So when we talk about acute kidney injury, really what we're talking about is that there's a drop in GFR, right? So if we think of the kidneys as the washing machines of the body, the the normal normally functioning kidneys should be filtering about 100 to 120 mLs per minute, or I, I, the way I describe it is 120 drops of blood per minute. Whenever there's an AKI, that means that there's a, been a sudden slowdown of the kidneys. So what is causing the kidneys to slow down? And when it's happening recurrently, the most common scenario that we see this happening has to do with hemodynamics. So something is affecting the perfusion of the kidney. The kidney is one of the most, I would say, selfish, but also very forgiving organs. So it gets 20% of the cardiac output. So with every heartbeat, 20% uh, of, of, the, of the blood circulation goes to the kidney. So the kidney takes a lot of blood. Um, but whenever there's a, an injury, it can recover. So that's why I say it's, 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 uh, it's high drama and it's uh, high maintenance, but it's also very forgiving. And what I like to say about um, you know, these recurrent AKIs is that the, usually the most common causes really do have to do with a drop in perfusion to the kidney. So those are the first things that I wanna see, given his history with uh, cardiac problems, 
um, diabetes, like are we dealing with heart failure, things like that. Cirrhosis is another condition in which we see these recurrent AKIs due to hemodynamics. Um, however, um, oh, sorry, and one other thing, uh, recurrent obstruction. So patients that have uh, pelvic organs that can lead to um, intermittent obstruction can also lead to recurrent AKI. So patients who have prostates, patients who have ovaries, um, we could see this, especially when there's abnormal masses, things like that. However, things that are leading me against these, uh, this differential and what really um, is making me think differently is this cola-colored urine. So whenever we see cola-colored urine, again, that usually is signifying that there's blood from some, there's a source. And then the question is like, where is this blood coming from? And blood can come from a lot of different places along the urinary tract. So it could either come from the ureters, the bladder, the urethra. So that's what we call the lower urinary tract. Um, or it could come from the kidney itself. So blood can come from the kidney. So now all of a sudden what we have into play here is um, an inflammatory disease of the kidney, which we call glomerular diseases or glomerulonephritides. So I really don't know what could be going on with this patient. It could really be any of these things. I'm thinking less likely hemodynamic related unless we find out that he has um, uh, a more advanced heart or liver disease. But um, certainly like a glomerular disease, I'm thinking about that. Or yes, yeah, something along the urinary tract. Um, stones can cause uh, blood in the urine, uh, things like that. Uh, recurrent stones. So that could fit. So right now we're still thinking a pretty broad differential. And so my questions are going to be really focused around other signs of a, of a systemic inflammatory condition, like a glomerular disease. So I want to ask about rashes. I want to ask about recent infections. I want to ask about um, foam in the urine, which typically represents protein. Uh, I want to ask about stones. Have they passed any stones? Um, do, do they have pain? Uh, pa pain? Painless hematuria is different than painful hematuria. So these are kind of like the broad questions that I have uh, from the get-go. Oh, you're muted. All right. Uh, so uh, moving along to his physical exam in labs, um, he's afebrile, blood pressure is 130 over 80, um, breathing comfortably on room air. Um, really, physical exam is pretty unremarkable. Um, uh, the skin exam has no rashes, um, no splinter hemorrhages seen on his fingernails. There might be a clue for endocarditis. Um, and he has no low extremity edema, which can be a sign of potentially um, nephrotic syndrome. So overall, fairly benign physical exams. Okay, and then um, we also have the patient's labs because he uh, presented earlier in the morning to have his blood work dr uh, drawn routinely prior to presenting to clinic. So um, his sodium is 132, potassium is four, chloride is 108, bicarb is 18, BUN is 56, and then creatinine is five. Um, glucose is 140. And then his calcium is 8.2. Um, I don't have his phosphorus, so his magnesium. Um, his AST, ALT are normal, and, but his albumin is um, 2.7. And then, because um, it's a kidney clinic, we also have a UA. And the UA shows uh, three plus protein on dipstick with large blood. And um, we have his urine here as well. I'll, um, I'll uh, share my slides to look over his urine. Can you guys see? Can see? Can you guys see my screen? Um, yeah. So this is this is his urine, just in a urine cup. Um, this is after we've spun it in a centrifuge, and you can see at the bottom there's a pellet at the that will later um will remove the urine and then um, uh, resuspend uh, re a pellet in the very very small amount of urine that's left just with sur surface tension in in the tube, and then we'll look at it under a microscope. Um, so does this 
make you think about anything or does this change your differential looking at this just briefly? Yeah, no, uh, definitely. So this is making me think that there's a, a very active process going on. So from the get-go, I'm kind of very concerned about this patient. Usually when we have bleeding from stones or from the urinary tract, usually the, the blood is, is more red, it's more bright red because there's trauma somewhere along you know, the urinary tract. This um, is looking to me like there's more, there's potentially um, it, more of a glomerular origin. Um, also looking at the urinary sediment, I do see that there's a lot of debris. So um, you could see kind of the outline of a cast, um, which we would have to look in higher magnification. But I just want to know what is making up this cast. Um, so cast is really just the mold of the inside of the nephron of the tubule of something that's in high concentration. So when you see here about a, um, a you know a granular cast, that's something that we typically see in acute tubular necrosis is um, the um, debris from tubular epithelial cells that are sloughing off, that are dying. If you see red blood cells, that's pathognomonic for a glomerular disease. So you have uh, blood essentially escaping into the urinary space um, due to an inflammation in the glomerular filtration barrier, which is not normal. Um, if you see white blood cells, that could indicate either infection or an, um, uh, a, in, um, what we call like an, an inflammatory, like almost like an allergic reaction just from white blood cells um, infiltrating the, the kidney interstitium and escaping into the urinary space as well. So I just would really want to see a little bit higher power to see what's going on here. But this to me looks, the, the code words here is active sediment. There's stuff going on. Like this is not a bland sediment where you don't see cells, you don't see casts. Okay. And then um, I have, let's see, I have a screen of something that's slightly higher power. It's not the exact same urine sediment, but something very similar. Do you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. So, why do you get? What do you think about this? The cells here, Leticia. All right. So, what we're seeing here is you see all these little round things. What you want to look at whenever you see anything like this, obviously, you're thinking these are cells, right? So, what kind of cells are they? Are they so the the ones that look like donuts? Um, and when they don't have nuclei, these are essentially red blood cells. So, these are um, red blood cells. And what you want to see is they should look smooth. So if you could point to one, David, um, so I could talk about it a little bit. It really does look like mm -hmm. a donut. So yes, like this. It should just be perfectly round, no nuclei, and it's small. On the other hand, there's other cells that look like they have spikes. They start looking like popcorn or I guess more recently like coronavirus. These could be a little bit tricky to, to tease out because this red blood cells uh, they can, depending on the osmolality of the urine, they can become shriveled like this. But if you see it, and you could find one uh, for us, David, that there's some that have little dots around the edges, that these start making me think that these are what we call dysmorphic RBCs or like blebs are starting to form. And these indicate that the red blood cells are passing through an inflamed glomerular filtration barrier. So it's hard to really, um, you know, say exactly, um, you know, are, is this just from a very um, hypertonic urine, from a very hyperosmolar urine, or are they really going, uh, the red blood cells, are they passing through an inflamed glomerular filtration barrier? And, you know, uh, this along with the tea color urine, it's just really starting to make me think that these are actually dysmorphic red blood cells. And what we're dealing with here is a glomerular disease. All right. So very worried about a glomerular disease with potentially nephritic syndrome. So I'm sure we're all very excited to get to the actual patient history. So. All right. So um, going back to the patient history, um, about two years ago, he had a melanoma excision, and that excision was complicated by a skin infection um, that ended up growing penicillin-resistant E. coli. I'm not sure how he got E. coli in his skin, um, but at the time, his, his prior outpatient creatinines had always been 0.9 to 1.1, and around that time, it peaked to 1.3. Um, but then it 
kind of got better on its own. Wasn't People weren't thinking too much about it. Um, but then earlier this year, prior to presentation, um, his new baseline creatinine was about 1.2, and he had a couple of days of worsening sore throat and poor oral intake. Um, outpatient labs showed his creatinine was newly increased to 1.9. So he was told to present to the hospital. Um, at the time, he, um, given the creatinine of 1.9, and then also reports that there was blood seen on the UA, um, a nephritic panel was sent. Um, so Leticia, if you're sending an, a broad nephritic panel workup, um, what kind of labs would you be sending and, and how might the physical exam or history um, change what labs you would send? Yeah, this is a good question because many times, um, you know, some of these tests and for the nephritic panel, we're talking about antibody tests and serologies that take a few days to come back. So in practicality, what ends up happening is what we say, we, they throw the kitchen sink or everything gets sent at once. But, you know, really thinking about, you know, an older gentleman who uh, recently had an infection, things that you're going to want to check for are common things being common, an infection related glomerular disease. So you definitely want to check complements. Um, also, something that is uh, common, a, a GM that is more uh, frequently seen in older age is our ANCA-related vasculitides. So has a vasculitis developed um, in this patient? Um, the, the other thing, less likely, although it gets sent all the time, but I'm not really thinking about lupus, although you can, you can be fooled. Lupus, we typically associate with a younger population, but, um, and typically females, but this is not to say that we haven't seen it in, in, in men. And certainly it could have, it has been described in the literature, uh, older, older men, but, you know, uh, many people will send a, an ANA and double stranded DNA, I think less likely in his situation, but it's something to consider. The other um, typical nephritic disease that we think of that a lot of people immediately send is the anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody, anti-GBM. One thing that I would say is that this patient, these patients do not usually present with recurrent AKIs. These patients present with what we call a rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis or RPGN, um, where the, the creatinine just takes off, like the kidney is in shutdown mode. The GFR is dropping quickly. And, um, and the creatinine is going up very, very rapidly. So I'm also thinking less likely in this situation, but you know, we'll send it. And then, um, you know, the urine does have three plus protein and I don't wanna ignore that because his serum albumin was also low. So I can't rule out that this patient doesn't have an overlap nephrotic nephritic syndrome. Remember that nephrotic syndrome um, has, uh, there's three characteristics, um, edema, uh, nephrotic range proteinuria, so more than 3.5 grams uh, per day, and then um, uh, low serum albumin, which this patient um, doesn't really have all that much in terms of edema, but does have what this seems to be a lot of protein and low serum albumin. Um, so could there be an overlap syndrome of nephrotic nephritic? There could be. In those situations, the other things we think about are paraprotein related diseases. So um, especially in an older gentleman who has a history of malignancy, could there be a myeloma leading to um, an amyloidosis, a um, light chain deposition disease, cast nephropathy, things like that? You know, it's it's in the differential. So I would send an SPEP, UPEP, uh, immunofixation. Um, so I, I would I would check these things. Great, yeah, most of those things were sent. Um, I'll will, I will say too, with, um, with anti-GBM disease, you don't always have it, but um, often with a, there's a pulmonary involvement as well with like hemoptysis or like foamy pink urine, because really um, you'd, be, you'd see bleeding coming from the alveoli, so much foamier than like frank uh, bright red blood um, and very, very concerning diagnosis. Like you need to, to act very rapidly with um, treat, treatment with immunosuppression um, plus minus plex, depending on the clinical situation, just because um, the longer time that you wait, um, the less likelihood you might have of, of preventing permanent kidney injury or a severe uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, okay, but he um, did have an ANA and lupus panel and DSDNA sent that was all negative. Um, ANCA was sent and was negative. Um, albumin to creatinine ratio was sent. 
um, at the time it was only 70 milligrams per gram. Um, so, so not particularly elevated, at least earlier this year. Um, rapid uh, strep antigen was sent via throat swab and was positive in the setting of a sore throat. Um, ASO was negative. Um, complement was sent. Um, C3 level was low at 32 and C4 was undetectable. Um, so his creatinine peaked to, to four and then improved to 1.7 with fluids during that hospital stay. And, and then he was discharged. Um, yeah, urine eosinophils were also sent um, by the hospital at the time and were negative. Um, so do, do, does anything from the lab work change your differential, Leticia? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, um, so here what we were talking about because of this history of an infection, one of the things that you know we talked about was infection-related GN, and it's interesting the ASO was negative, but the rapid um, the rapid throat swab was positive. And one thing that is a hallmark of infection-related GN is that you should see a concurrent infection. So it's not like a you know another GN that is uh, typically associated with infection is IgA nephropathy. But in, in these patients, they can have a cola colored urine. And I didn't bring that up in the differential um, and I should have, but the thing is that with IgA, usually you see cola colored urine and a rise in the creatinine weeks after the infection. So that's the differentiating um, characteristic of these two diseases when we're talking about IgA versus infection related um, uh, GN. And uh, for, so for this patient, if he has, a, a, a throat swab that is positive for strep right now, and we're seeing low complements, then this is to me, this is going higher on the differential um, for sure. This is, uh, I'm, I'm thinking more about uh, a potentially infection related GN uh, because of the concurrent infection and the rise, uh, the rise in the creatinine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, a couple uh, other interesting things stood out to me. Um, I thought this would be a good learning poll about urine eosinophils. Um, it's something that I think we frequently send sometimes when considering AIN. Um, however, in the last, um, I don't know, five, 10 years, um, there's been more data coming out that you're, really urine eosinophils aren't very helpful for um, differentiating AIN from ATN. Um, the biggest retrospective study probably came out from Mariti et al., but they looked at like 550 patients that had urine AOs and kidney biopsy sent. And basically the uh, specificity for AIN versus ATN of positive urine AOs was like 50%. Um, so you're flipping a coin trying to differentiate between the two. So not very helpful. Um, and sim similarly, the sensitivity was low, like 15 to 30%. So if it's not sensitive or specific, it, it's not really a helpful test. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting too, um, complements. And the fact that his C3 and C4 are both low, um, it's it's not really a hard and fast rule, but, um, and, and I, I will give the disclaimer that in medical school and then residency and then fellowship, the complement system is something I constantly have to review and remind myself about because there are just so many steps. But um, if you remember the, there the are two, well, I guess three pathways, but the two that are relevant to your kidneys, um, things can either be activated through the, um, they can either be activated through the uh, classical pathway, and that involves um, an antigen and antibody complex. And the classical pathway needs C4 to be um, to, uh, as part of this process. But the, um, the alternative pathway doesn't use C4, it just needs C3, right? Um, so if a process is using the anti the classical pathway through the antigen antibody complex that then is being dysregulated as part of your kidney disease, you'll see both C3 and C4 low. But if it's a process that, that, that's only involving the alternative pathway, C4 isn't being consumed. So only C3 will be low by itself. So this patient, um, you might consider it probably has something that's involving the classical pathway more. Um, I will say though that complement activity isn't necessarily sensitive or specific for, for certain diseases. Um, it can be clues, um, but it's still helpful to check um, one 
as a clue. And then two, um, because then you can then trend complement activity out in the future to see if it's getting better with your treatments and things. Um, I'll say, for example, so like kidney diseases that have low C3 alone, that alternative pathway um, could be like um, HIV immune complex disease, um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and then um, a disease called C3GN, which is a complement dysregulation of the alternative pathway. Um, and then things that involve normally low C3 and C4, um, the common ones will be like uh, lupus is the biggest one that we'd be seeing, um, cryoglobulinemia, of which, you know, hepatitis B and C can also trigger cryoglobulinemia. So that's an example of how like sometimes the lines between these two can be blurred. Um, and then um, all the immune complex mediated um, membranoid proliferative glomerulonephritis can also <laughs> can also cause this, but uh, there's certainly a lot of overlap. Okay, so that happened for this patient. Um, luckily, it seemed like he got better with supportive care, maybe these fluids. Um, potentially, at this point, we're thinking this is infection-related GN, um, especially because of the um, hematuria, the low complements, like low complement C3 and low C4, and around when he had like a new strep vote. Um, so he was discharged. Um, but unfortunately, three months later after this discharge, um, he was vacationing in Southern California, and he had new onset nausea, vomiting, diarrhea and presented to urgent care where his creatinine was found to be two. Um, he was admitted to the hospital and given fluids. Um, his creatinine eventually peaked to, to 5.7 um, before downtrending. Um, at the time, they repeated a UA. Um, we don't have those results, but reportedly it was bland. Um, rapid strep at that time was negative. Um, and then um, with supportive care, his creatinine just got better to, to 1.6. Um, unfortunately, a month after that, he was admitted again to the hospital um, with sore throat and worsening hematuria, now gross. And uh, at this time, his uh, AKI, we don't have the exact number, but it worsened to the point where he was on dialysis for three days. Um, at that point, um, more infectious serologies were sent. Um, yeah, well, I'll give them to you here because we've already discussed them on the differential. But um, anti-GBM was negative. Um, HIV was negative. Um, hepatitis B, uh, C, and A were all negative. Um, S-PEP, U-PEP, serum-free light chains were sent and were negative. Um, Lyme disease antibody was negative. Um, and then his albumin to creatinine ratio was increased to um, 800 milligrams per gram when previously it was just like 70 milligrams per gram. Um, C3 was still low at, four, um, at 40 and C4 was two. Um, and at this point, um, does your differential change at all, Leticia? And what, what would you wanna do next? Oh, yeah, it changes quite a bit um, because the, the, the normal trajectory or the natural history of an infection related GN is that you see a rise in the creatinine usually around the same time as, as an infection, as we were mentioning before, but it does not typically have this waxing and waning pattern. Like things get better and then it comes back. Infection related GN, uh, usually with the treatment of the infection, this patient has gotten a lot of antibiotics, it seems. And they even came in on penicillin. And so to me, this is really raising a red flag that this is not actually what we're dealing with, even though it has a lot of the mimickers of infection related GN in terms of uh, cola colored urine, low complements, a recent infection. This waxing and waning pattern just, just does not go along with it, to be quite honest. And so um, at this point, thinking about what are the diseases that we discussed about in our differential that um, can give you cola colored urine and that can give you this nephritic pattern and and um, uh, and, and low complements. Now we're getting into these um, other 
complement activating diseases like uh, like C3 glomerulonephritis, um, which exists on a continuum with the something else called dense deposit disease. And so in um, dense deposit disease and C3GN, both of these patients, uh, both of these diseases, you can have an overlap of nephrotic and nephritic. So this is starting to get, you know, a little bit higher, um, higher on my differential. Things like pyoglobulinemia um, and things like that, um, things associated with the other infections like hepatitis or HIV, obviously are not really in the differential anymore because um, the, he's tested negative for, um, for the, these diseases. But I'm just really starting to think more, what is consuming complement? and keeps happening over and over again. So, so that's what I'm thinking. And at this time, I think, um, you know, hopefully uh, even a few hospitalizations ago, we need, we need a biopsy. All so, right, yes, definitely. He definitely tissue. needs a biopsy. Oh, someone else talk? No, yeah, I'm saying give me some tissue. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, Definitely needs a biopsy for us to figure out what's going on. Um, Amanda has said, totally agree. So let's take a look at the pathology. All right. You guys see the screen? Yes. All right. Take us away, Leticia. All right. So the first thing that we want to see is that um, here, what you should, what we should be seeing in a normal kidney is that the capillary loops there should be open space. Um, so sorry about that. Give me one second. Sorry. Um, so we, what we should be seeing is um, capillary open spaces. And what you see here is that there are no open spaces. So there's a lot of cells. And uh, so the, that's the dark blue. So there's a lot, a lot of cells, usually within each loop. Maybe we would talk about 15 to 20, um, 15 to 20 cells here. We're definitely seeing a lot more. And then the more pinkish, light purple, or like the mesangium is expanded. So here we're talking. We're starting to see a more what we would call a membrane proliferative. So the glomerular basement membranes they're proliferating. So there's more cells, and there's just in general more mesangium, more tissue. So this is what I'm seeing here, just on on light microscopy. And then I do want to make a note. So this is the glomerulus of the kidney, and I should have oriented you there. This cauliflower-looking thing, but around it are the tubules. And I just want to point out that on the left of the of the glomerulus, we have healthy and normal looking tubules with cuboidal epithelial cells. But if you look on the right side, you see that some of these, the, the nice little epithelium uh, that is on the left side, we're not seeing it here. So this patient also has some tubular necrosis. So you can diagnose ATN on kidney biopsy, and we're definitely seeing it here. And, and, the, and the different tubules are at different stages. You can see that the one in the top left corner, there's like active sloughing going on as we see. It's like an active process. Some are already sloughed off and others are uh, flattening like in the lower right-hand corner. Yeah, you know, I do think it's interesting. Some of the history when his creatinine was getting better and getting worse and then like peaking, that really did seem like there was some component of ATN that he was intermittently experiencing and then recovering from maybe from the dehydration periods or something. Um, yeah. Monitoring the chat. Yeah, she is amazing. Information, amazing how much information you can get from a biopsy. Excellent. And then um, let's see, next yeah, slide here. here. Sorry, go, can we go back and just one, and one more time? The other thing is you can ac actually see the red blood cells going through the tubules. If you can, yeah, there we go. So this is um, what we end up seeing and what's leading to the color, uh, cola colored urine and the red blood cell cast that is most likely what we were seeing. So yeah, it's, it's like ca catching like a freeze pain in time. Yeah. And you can almost see how you can imagine the red blood cells would become dysmorphic once they've made it to the urine. You're already seeing little little like blebs of them as they're being pushed through. All right, and then what about this? So here, similarly, so here, what we call, this is um, what we call the silver stain that is really um, a staining the glomerular, glomerular basement membrane. And what you're starting to see here is that 
um, you you start seeing some re, um, reduplication. Like the 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 membrane is not just one one wire. There's like multiple wires. So there's something separating the glomerular basement membrane um, here. And so again, a similar appearance of mesangium expanded, more cells. Um, and just the glomerular basement membrane doesn't look healthy. So a lot of inflammation going on here. Okay, and, and what things can cause the um, the glomerular basement membrane to, to be duplicated? Good question. So here what we're talking about, especially when we're talking about a complement um, consuming uh, a complement uh, consuming uh, process is we talk about deposits. So there's these, uh, they're autoimmune, uh, sometimes antibodies, sometimes complement, sometimes we don't know what makes up the deposits, but it's something that we, um, that is depositing within the glomerular basement membrane that's causing it to have this, uh, this appearance. And so from here, we really need um, the stain that we need is the electron microscopy, or not the stain or, or the, the, the process. What we need to do to the tissue is process it with electron microscopy to take a look at really, really high power what's going on in the glomerular basement membrane. All right. Um, and, you know, um, this is immunofluorescence. Um, always with this, you need to just see what the pathologist is labeling because they can be staining for a variety of things. Um, this is immunofluorescence staining for C3. And um, we have from the reports that the other immunofluorescence for immunoglobulins, such as IgG, were all uh, negative. Right, exactly. So, and so this is something that um, is very telling also. So in nephritic uh, diseases, the immunofluorescence get really getting at what is the antibody that is staining can also really give a, a lot of uh, a lot of information. And so, as uh, David mentioned, like the IgG and C3 being um, positive on immunofluorescence are also leading us to this diagnosis. Okay, and then we have the um, electron microscopy here. Yeah. So let me orient you here because this is a very weird stain. So imagine that when you're looking at a, a kidney biopsy, you see all these loops, right? You see the loops. Imagine now zooming in like a thousand times um, and now you're seeing just one loop. When you look at the area that is concave, so inside is inside the glomerular capillary loop and the light gray is the glomerular basement membrane. And what it should be is this light, uh, light, healthy, light gray color. What we shouldn't be seeing are these dark gray spots. Th that's not normal. And so this is where, where we can see that there's some deposits, there's something that's staining and, and really making, it's separating out the glomerular basement membrane. And these deposits, I will say in infection related GN, because it also it's also a complement consuming a GN, it's also a, uh, you can see deposits. Typically, however, you see them on the other side of the glomerular basement membrane on the outside or what we say the epithelial side. And it's what's described as um, camel humps. Here, we're seeing them on the endothelial, on the inside, uh, the inside layer or the endothelial cell layer. The other thing to note here is on the outside, usually what's lining the epithelial or the epithelial cell layer is the podocytes. So you may or may not remember um, from your renal anatomy and or microstructure is that the podocytes have uh, or uh, the epithelial cells that are keeping the, glomer the glomerulus together have foot processes. So the podocyte foot processes should be here. And we see here that it, it's flattened. So it's very flattened. We don't have healthy podocytes. So there's a lot of damage going on in this glomerular basement membrane. And usually it's the damage to the podocytes that's leading to the significant proteinuria that we're seeing in this patient. So that explains why this patient has proteinuria. All right, so taking all that together, um, what, do you, what disease do you think this patient has? Well, now this is really looking more to me like the C3GN, to be quite honest, because of the deposits that we're seeing, we definitely know that the also complements are low. So this is uh, on immunofluorescence, we see IgG and C3 that are staining. So we know that this is the kidney is, um, this is a, a systemic disease that the kidney is the one that's manifesting it. Because as I was mentioning before, the kidney is the washing machine of the body, right? It's the filter. But when it's filtering high quantities of complement bound with antibody, and you have this complement activation, 
the kidney can't really filter that. And so it all it starts depositing within the glomerular basement membrane. And that's what causes the manifestation of disease, the proteinuria, all this, the blood in the urine, the drop in the GFR, the kidneys slow down. And that's all because the kidneys filtering the blood that is carrying all this um, uh, uh, complement consumption. And so that's that's what we're seeing. Yeah, great. Um, I'll, <clears throat> I'll, I'll uh, highlight for you guys too, that based off the um, immunofluorescence, one thing that can help differentiate it from the other disease on a differential, which was the um, infection-related GN, was that the IgG was staining negative. Usually you would think IgG would stain positive for infection-related GN. Um, and then lastly, the, um, uh, the, the electron microscopy can really help us differentiate C3GN from dense deposit disease, which is very, I'll, I can go into it later, but they're, they're almost in many ways the same, a very similar disease uh, pathophysiologically. Um, the difference is that with uh, C3GN, you'll see these patchy subendothelial infiltrates, so they can also be elsewhere. Um, but dense deposit disease, you'll see a very, very thick, heavy black ribbon all along. It's very dense, the deposits. So it's, it's, it's very striking. Why is C4 low? Um, I think that's a really, really great question. Um, and it gets to what I was talking about before with um, how you normally think about um, C3 being low isolated when the alternative pathway is involved, and then C3, C4 both being low when the um, when the classical pathway is involved, and normally C3GN is the alternative pathway. Um, I will say that you often have some overlap of disease processes. And I think potentially if someone is just very, very inflamed, then what might begin as just the alternative pathway could then later also activate the um, classical pathway and then you would see both complements being low. It's not It's not necessarily specific. Um, do you yeah. have anything else to add with that, Leticia? Oh, that's exactly right. That sometimes one thing will trigger the other. And so um, it can, uh, you can see them both. Um, you can see an overlap. Yeah, but, but great that you pointed out the discrepancy from what we were saying earlier. That was a great teaching point. Um, okay. So at this point, I, I think we can... Uh, safely say that he probably had C3GN on pathology. Um, at that point, he recovered from his kidney injury, um, and they weren't quite sure what was happening because um, C3GN is such a rare diagnosis. Um, so he was he was discharged. Uh, saying uh, IgG normally positive in infection related GN. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, he was discharged from uh, the hospital to go to a uh, GN clinic. Um, and that's where you're seeing him today. Basically, he just left the hospital to come to your clinic. Um, he was discharged with a creatinine of, of 2.2 the day prior. And now it's the new morning and it's in your clinic. And you have his labs showing the large blood, three plus protein and the creatinine of five. So uh, what would you want to do, Leticia? Yeah, so... The, this patient unfortunately is going to do a U-turn right back into the hospital because um, what, what we're seeing here is that usually in low GFRs, there could be fluctuations in serum creatinine. There's no question that a creatinine can go up and down with um, subsequent lab draws. But to go from a 2 to 5.7, this patient's kidneys are going down so fast um, that I'm very, very worried um, I'm very, very worried that we need to do something to intervene immediately. And even though the patient initially came with a diagnosis of infection-related GN, this is very clearly not what that is. And so the patient needs to stop getting antibiotics for infections that are not really there and needs to get treatment for the disease that he actually has, which is C3GN. And with the creatinine going up like this, that means that the GFR is essentially dropping down to zero. What happens when you don't have filtration uh, of, of the blood? You're going to have electrolyte, acid-base abnormalities, volume overload, confusion, altered mental status. You're going to have a lot of complications. So for me, the decision process to admit someone is, is this someone that I could keep safe at home while I wait for tests to happen in the outpatient setting? 
And the answer in this patient is no, I cannot do that safely because even from the day before to the next day, his his kidneys are just shutting down. So this patient needs to be helped um, more, more immediately. Great. And then Hafa asked, would you use immunosuppressants? Yes. So, so this is a good question that comes up all the time. So a common, <clears throat> excuse me, a common question in this, in this scenario is that sometimes people would say, say, well, do you need a re-biopsy? Is there a problem with the original biopsy? You know, did you not get the right diagnosis? In this patient, that was not the issue. So the question was not to re-biopsy him. Um, so, but the other question is, what is the pros and cons of starting immunosuppression? The reason why we're thinking about starting immunosuppression is because this patient is essentially facing dialysis if we don't do something soon. So that's a benefit or a pro of doing immunosuppressant. A con is if there is an infection, you can make it worse, right? Because now we're suppressing the immune system. So can we safely say that this patient doesn't have an infection? So you quickly, you know, you check for fever, you check, you know, you do a physical exam, and you do the best that you can. And so in this patient, um, we didn't have a, a, a telltale sign that he had an infection going on. So we actually opted to start him on uh, pulse dose steroids at the, like immediately. Uh, and that was the decision-making process to try to prevent him from going on dialysis again. Yep, so he got admitted to the hospital, um, started on pulse dose steroids with one gram per, gra um, one gram per day of IV methylpred. And then um, while he was be while he was admitted, he had his nephritic workup resent um, along with a full complement panel, and um, he also had his SPEP UPEP resent. And um, this time, his SPEP showed a very small pair of protein, zero point two. Um, what what do you think about the pair of protein, Leticia? I will tell you that this um, to find the pair of protein, to be honest, is almost a bit of a relief. For a long time, C3GN was considered to be an idiopathic or a genetic condition uh, caused by um, a, a defect uh, along the complement regulatory pathway. And so we didn't have really good treatments, but then we discovered that actually complement can also be activated by a plasma cell clone. Something in the bone marrow is causing this C3 uh, to become uh, to become consumed. Uh, and so the, this already gives us a direct, a more direct target to treat because steroids are just a blanket immunosuppression, right? So you have blanket immunosuppression and you're just, you don't really know what you're treating, but now that you have a plasma cell clone, this is most likely the source of the etiology that is activating the complement and it's causing it to deposit in the kidney. So now we have a more direct uh, way to, um, to actually to treat, to treat this patient. And so in this situation, we have to quickly get our hematology colleagues involved in order to, um, to figure out what is the best treatment uh, to shut down this clone that is producing this. Yeah, so he had a bone marrow biopsy. Um, the bone marrow biopsy itself didn't identify any uh, clonal population in his plasma cells, um, uh, but he did also have a flow cytometry done that showed a very, very small, um, potentially insignificant, but potentially clinically significant clonal population. Um, so in, that in the setting of his paraprotein and also in the setting of his subsequent like complement dysregulation, um, he was started on cyborg D therapy and um, he actually is doing really well now. Um, it's been many, many years out. Um, his kidney function recovered without ever needing dialysis. And I think his creatinine is hanging out around two and it's been like half a decade. Yeah, exactly right. And so, um, so these plasma directed therapies, um, there's been a recent article in, uh, in blood that actually came out right around the time this patient presented that talked about outcomes in patients that had kidney diseases from plasma cell clone, or what we call um, mon um, monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance, which is C3GN is one of the diseases in, in, this, um, in, this, uh, in this category. And basically um, what they found is that patients do very well. And yeah, this patient has been doing excellent. I actually recently saw him and he has very little protein. He does have a creatinine of two, which what I really want to highlight here is that this patient, um, even though 
now he's finally on the right treatment and he responded very well. A creatinine of two is only giving him a GFR of 30 to 35 mLs per minute. So he has really impaired kidney function. Um, so he now has chronic kidney disease. And this is, result, uh, is a result of the scarring from the chronic inflammation that was going on and on due to the delay in diagnosis. And so now other things that we are using for him is um, making sure that <clears throat> all the common treatments for for chronic kidney disease, especially when there's proteinuria like RAS inhibition. So ACE inhibitors, we're using that. Um, and now SGLT2 inhibitors that are like, you know, a godsend, they're just helping with all types of diseases. We have him on this uh, on these uh, treatments as well, making sure that his lipids are under control, his glucose is under control, his blood pressure is under control, just to really try to keep him from ever needing to go on dialysis um, now that he's on the treatment. And he is um, once um, another thing just to mention very briefly, there's a lot of technicalities um, when we start going into hematologic uh, treatments, um, but there's um, uh, induction therapy and then there's consolidation therapy. And so he's most likely going to remain on um, on this uh, treatment that he's on, uh, which is um, uh sorry, daratumumab. He's taking, he's still taking daratumumab, sometimes with carfizumib, but he's just on daratumumab. He's probably going to stay on that because um, when once um, we tried to taper him off the plasma therapy, he tried to flare again and we're like, okay, enough. You uh, be, on, be on plasma directed therapy and the treatments are pretty well tolerated. They're not as, they don't have as many side effects as for example, steroids do. Yeah. So that's All right. It. Um, thanks for it. Is there time to go over a couple of slides to consolidate what we talked about or is the. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so he ended up uh, developing C3 uh, after uh, being treated for C3G and doing doing um, not too bad, which was, was very thankful. I'm glad he never ended up needing dialysis. Um, let's see. So do you guys see my slide here? I'll try to um, yes. be yes. relatively brief, but we'll, I, was, I wanted to take the chance to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology, then the presentation and diagnosis, and then finally the treatment of C3GN, which Leticia has already been discussing, but it's always good to review and, and hear things twice, I think. Um, great. Um, so like we were saying, C3GN is really a problem with increased activity of the alternative complement pathway. And, um, you know, it can either, whenever I think about disease processes, I try to keep things bigger picture. So either there's something there that's increasing activity of the C3 pathway, or there's something that's decreasing the inhibition of it. Um, and that can be very broad, but um, some examples are like, there can be a circulating factor called like C3 nephritic factor, and that can increase the activity of it. And then, um, you might have other problems such as like factor H, um, which normally inhibits the alternative pathway um, being removed or like having a genetic defect in it. And then losing that regulation also leads to increased activity. Um, this is just a review of the complement cascade. Um, again, very many steps. I think the, my biggest takeaway is that in the, in the classical pathway, you see C4 is here. And that's a complement um, level that we test for in the serum, so clinically relevant. Um, and then C3 is part of the alternative pathway, and then also the common pathway that they all reach at the end. So all the complement things leads to low C3. But only the classical pathway usually has low C4. But like we already discussed, this patient didn't follow that pattern, and it's common that patients don't. Um, this is a similar, but also very, very busy slide. Um, I don't want to like take too much away from it. Other than that, if you see these red stars, this top part is the classical pathway. The bottom part is the alternative pathway. Um, these red stars are all drugs that are currently being evaluated to potentially treat um, increased complement activity. And this purple star, echolizumab, is the only um, current drug that's FDA approved for various 
um, direct complement in inhibition. So you might see echolizumab used um, in the future. I certainly have a couple of times um, in, in any disorder with complement dysregulation, but um, in particular, I've, I've seen it for like um, hemolytic uremic syndrome. So um, C3GN is, is pretty rare. Um, the prevalence is just like 14 and 140, 14 to 140 cases per million. Um, you know, normally it can be preceded by a URI, um, which can make it look similar to infection-related GN. I guess there, there, there must be something, in, if that's the case, about the, the viral proteins from the URI, like triggering some like latent activity within your immune system that then like revs it up afterward. Um, I think that's common in general for many autoimmune diseases. The presentation is super variable. Um, they can have isolated hematuria, isolated proteinuria, or both. And it can range from having completely normal kidney function to rapidly pro progressive glomerulonephritis with like pretty urgent kidney failure. Um, many have low C3 levels, but that's not a hard or fast rule. And there's often hypertension. Um, you know, because it can have such a broad different uh, presentation, the, the diagnosis for it can be pretty tricky. You really have to go along your like nephritic or nephrotic eval, like we were discussing uh, previously. And then um, um, as part of that, the SPEP, UPEP, and SAM free light chains are really helpful. Um, because as Leticia was saying, if that's positive, in many ways that can be very lucky for you and the patient because now you have something you can treat. Um, and then some uh, clues and pearls that can differentiate it from post-infection GN. Um, if it's really persistent or recurrent, like Leticia was highlighting, that really fits more with C3GN or dense deposit disease. Um, really infection-related GN, if it, were, if it should be self-resolving once the infection gets better, um, usually. Um, and similarly, the C3 is persistently low in C3GN, but normally gets better in infection-related GN. So really just from the clinical history, even before the biopsy, if you're wondering about infection-related GN, um, the recurrence and persistence would already start uh, making you worry more about C3GN. Um, again, the in, uh, immunofluorescence staining will be really high for C3 with C3GN. I mean, it fits the name, so easy to remember. But the other immunoglobulins that you normally would see, like such, an, such as um, infection-related GN or lupus are absent. All right. Um, we already discussed the pathology. It's pretty variable. But biggest thing is the C3 staining with the negative immunoglobulins. Um, and then the electron micros microscopy can be variable too. Um, once you've established a diagnosis, um, it's pretty important to send off like a full complement panel and genetic testing, um, along with SPEP, UPEP, um, just because if, if you found a genetic defect or like exactly where in that previous complement cascade um, that I was showing you, you might be able to enroll them in a clinical trial if they're still having issues with their kidney function. Um, and if, for instance, you found um, factor H low, um, and that's a factor that should be present in other people's plasma, um, you can consider potentially treating them with plasma infusions or plasma exchange to give them the, the factor H that they're missing. Um, but in general, you know, C3GN is pretty rare and pretty nuanced treatment that's largely based on expert opinion. So ideally, um, you could present them at some kind of GN board or GN conference, or at least with your other colleagues so that you can start to learn more. Um, did we send genetic testing? Yeah, uh, we did, and it was negative, yep. Um, obviously, and this is true in all of medicine, managing the underlying problem is best. Um, and yeah, I think that is never wrong, never wrong in whatever disease we're talking about. Um, but in this case, if they have a plasma cell dyscrasia and you can treat that, then it's great. If there's a genetic deficiency, you can consider giving them more of the factor H back. Um, and then um, in other situations, then you can do immunosuppression. And again, this is in the realm of expert opinion, but like mycophenolate mofetil is an anti-metabolite um, and then steroids. Or if they're very sick, um, we can throw the kitchen sink at them with steroids, cyclophosphamide, and then um, echolizumab. And I, yeah, um, my big takeaways were that um, it can have a really broad range of presentation, so you kind of want to keep it in the back of your differential. Um, and really, the, the pathology can really help you out a lot 
with um, the C3 dominance and then without the immunoglobulin staining. And I will say the recurrence and persistence is a really big uh, clinical takeaway as well for differentiating it from infection-related GM that can have a similar history. And then once you figure out the diagnosis, um, then we can discuss the treatment as like we were saying before. All right. Do y'all have any questions or comments about anything? Oh, thank you so much. It was such a rich case and discussion. Um, I learned so much and I'm sure everyone learned a lot here. And I also love the slides and how you walk us through the slides. So thank you a lot. And Dr. Roland, do you have any final takeaways? No, I would just like to say that, um, you know, keep in mind, you know, always center around the patient. That's one thing that was really important for this patient because he had been to many different hospitals and saw many different doctors. And it was really uh, frustrating him that nobody could tell him what he actually had. And so it's important not to anchor, you know, this, uh, what was it, this anchoring bias that we want to avoid as much as possible because, um, you know, even, is you know, it, it seemed like everybody made sense, like what he had, but he wasn't getting better. So it couldn't be that. So I just want to leave you, leave you all with that pearl. Okay. So thank you so much. I hope you have a nice uh, rest of the day there. Bye-bye. Um, yeah, it's great meeting you all. It's it's lovely seeing faces from all over the world. Thank you. Bye.